This week, we're going to talk about aquatic animals. There is a lot to cover. Um, it can be broken into quite a few different pieces, so bear with me. This is chapter nine from Dodds and Wiles. Chapter 10 in the new version or the new edition. So we're going to start off with the um, oldest evolutionary organism. So the earliest um, the organisms we think evolved the earliest, and that would be the freshwater sponges. So sponges are filter feeders. They take particles in, they use what they like, and they ex exude what they expel, what they don't want. Um, they're very primitive in terms of body form. Um, Interestingly, a lot of the freshwater sponges have algal endosymbionts, so algal cells that live within the sponge tissues, and those endosymbionts produce photosynthate, so they photosynthesize, and then the sponge can utilize that photosynthate, so they, they kind of share, share space and share resources. They are supported by silicaceous spicules, so um, they need silica to grow um, and they they grow these really interesting shaped spicules and in freshwater ecosystems they're an important food resource for spongilla flies which I'll talk about later. Um, here is an interesting organism Seraclea fulva which is a caddis fly larva which I'll also talk about later but it builds its case out of bits of sponge. You can see some of the bits have the algal symbiont and some maybe don't. Um, these bits of sponge then are transported by the caddis fly and dispersed. So to new habitats, the sponge then could grow from these little bits that fall off of the caddis fly's case. At the bottom, E is showing you, you know, the habitat maybe for a freshwater sponge growing on a submerged piece of wood and the different shapes that the spicules might take, um, the different forms they might take. So lots of really interesting shapes for those pieces of silica inside the sponge. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about cnidarians. So these are more common in marine ecosystems, jellyfish, anemones, corals, and hydroids. But there are a few freshwater species. They tend to be drought resistant, which aids in dispersal. So they can be moved from one body of water to another um, and survive. And um, hydra are the ones that I see most commonly, little tiny um, polyps like in A, and they often also have photosynthetic symbionts. Um, so it seems like a, a pretty good way to go. Here's another couple pictures of Cordillifora, which grows in colonies um, and is actually can be invasive and get to nuisance levels. And then a jellyfish called Mastigius, which contains an endosymbiotic dinoflagellate that then that dinoflagellate photosynthesizes. So that's pretty cool. These are um, little tiny organisms called gastrotrits and rotifers. They tend to be um, classified as microinvertebrates, not macroinvertebrates. So when people are doing studies on benthic macroinvertebrates, they tend to ignore these little teeny tiny guys. Um, but nonetheless, they're important in freshwater ecosystems. Gastrotrits can um, withstand drying. Their eggs can withstand both drying and freezing for many years. So, you know, when a habitat goes dry, their eggs may persist in the soil. And then when water comes back to the system, they can rapidly grow. Rotifers are sometimes called wheel organisms. Their mouths tend to have kind of like a wheel of cilia around that they use for feeding. And they also have um, the ability to produce eggs that can withstand decades of desiccation. Yellowoid rotifers are interesting because they've never found any males, um, but a recent article that I read about stick insects um, talks about how really, really different the males and females look um, in terms of the stick insect. And so it made me wonder if maybe the same thing might be true. There might be extreme sexual polymorphism between males and females. So we don't even know they're the same species because they look so different. Rotifers are also important predators of bacteria. And the rotifer on the far right, Caratella, has some kind of spines coming off the end and it can actually grow those longer or shorter depending on predation pressure. So there's a lot of predators present. They might grow really long 
um, elongated spines that help it um, resist predation. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about platyhelminthes and nemertia. Uh, the platyhelminthes have um, organisms in three different classes, turbillaria, the flatworms, which tend to be predators and scavengers, trematoda, which are flukes, and many of these species are parasites, some human parasites. Same with the cestoda, which are tapeworms, also parasites. So I'm going to actually have you watch the next video where I talk more about interactions between nidaria and platyhelminthes.